So now what we're going to do is just move to a, a live demonstration and we're going to be able to see how all of these tools can work together to provide a robust framework for managing risk and compliance. So here we see a dashboard. And in the dashboard, when we think about this in terms of your first line of defense, we talked about how the first line of defense need SOP, a robust document management system, and feedback mechanisms. So the dashboards that you see here in Process 360 Live Design are going to help you to be able to segment and curate this information for different population groups. Maybe you have frontline workers that are uh, dealing with uh, processes on a more limited basis that might uh, have access to a dashboard that looks like this, where you might have someone else who is uh, looking at processes more holistically that has a different view that is more holistic in nature. Uh, going back to that frontline worker, maybe they're interested in uh, knowing exactly how they're supposed to perform a specific process. Now, very easily, they have access to that process. And they can go in and expand that and have access to the standard operating procedures. If you go, you can just click here on this narrative button. And now I can select a specific step in the process and I have all of my step-by-step -step instructions letting me know everything that I need to do. If there are training videos and things that are communicating things to me, those can be streamed from YouTube or Vimeo or some other video streaming site that's approved by the organization. If there are steps that need to be taken, uh, in another system, well, that can also be um, accessed simply by creating links that they can access straight from their operating procedures. And now they have a place to view all of this and it's all embedded in the diagrams that they're using to understand how to perform their role. If they see some information that seems to be wrong, if there seems to be something that needs to be taken care of, well, they can use the commenting feature, go in and say, you know, I believe that there's a risk here. And now this will end up alerting uh, those who are subscribers to this. And the subscribers are typically gonna be that second and third line of defense so that they can now uh, be mobilized to start to uh, look to see if this is accurate, uh, that they can then quantify that risk and they can come up with a mitigation strategy. And of course, then have that embedded into the very process framework that's being used uh, from an operating uh, procedure perspective. Now that second line of defense is going to need the risk management frameworks, the risk and compliance assessments, and also reporting. So how can that framework be determined? Well, if you go here to the model area, which is the heart and soul of Process 360 Live Design, you're going to see that you're going to be able to establish all of your requirement frameworks. So here we can see financial regulations like know your customer, Sarbanes-Oxley. It could be uh, other uh, uh, requirements like ISO norms or GDPR. Having all of these cataloged and being able to then relate them to the processes that they're governing is going to help the business units know when there are specific uh, laws and regulations that are governing those processes. In addition to that, control catalogs can also be established as can risk catalogs. And those will work together to be able to quantify risk and to quantify the effectiveness of the controls in the framework. And all of that can also be communicated to the business units. Assessments can be done. If we go here to repository configuration, we can go here to risks and we can see that all of this is customizable. So for example, you could customize your risk types. You can customize your risk categories, and you can also add values. So for example, if you wanted to state that a regulatory risk was going to be, uh, have a higher value in terms of impact and likelihood than an operational risk, well, you'd be able to do that. Uh, here you can define your risk parameters so that you can, through an impact and likelihood schema, uh, decide how risky a risk is. And then you can also, well, in terms of define your traffic light indicator thresholds, as well as define how you're going to configure a heat map that will then plot processes so that you can see what the riskiest processes are in your landscape. And the same thing could happen with controls and that you can go in when configuring this control, be able to define your control types and also your control ratings 
So you can determine what scale you want to use, what values you want to give those risks, those controls, so that you can then, through its effectiveness, reduce the level of risk and look at inherent versus residual risk scores. And again, all of that information can also be customized. So when you have this information, the, the ability to be able to communicate all of this information to the business units becomes greater. Because now if I'm looking at a process like this, I can go in and look at the describes information and I can see, for example, where I have specific risks to where I have specific controls that have been defined. So here you're noticing I have three risks or four risks rather that have been identified underneath that risk. You can see with an indentation that there is a control called a data review. Uh, there's a control here called card process accountability must be determined. And there's another one called check for typing errors. Here we have three controls for three risks. And you can clearly see that one of these risks does not have a control. If I want additional information about that, then all I have to do is go to my process itself. And then from here, I can go down and see what my risk values are. My inherent risk values based upon impact and likelihood. Uh, I can see what my residual risk values are based upon the controls that have been identified. So we can see that some of them have controls that are uh, existing, but some of them are that affected. And you can see that there are some warnings that are being given us there. And again, if I want to then go back even a little bit further to look at the risk itself, I can go there, look at the risk, and I can see, for example, in the data, what the impact is. I can see who it was that quantified it. I can see when, and I can also see the history of the risk profile so that if there's a risk event, that then changes the calculus, changes how we are going to categorize this from an impact and likelihood perspective. I can see when that changed. I can see who changed it. And all of that information is um, valuable for an audit. When it comes to being able to um, make sure that these numbers are accurate, either from a control perspective or from a risk perspective, we have what's called the managing of cycles. And that would allow you to be able to schedule specific reviews on a periodic basis. So for example, every six months, you could have this go to the risk owner, the control owner, uh, to make sure that there haven't been any risk events that are going to make you have to reclassify or requantify that risk. And from the perspective of a control, to be able to determine its effectiveness, to see if the effectiveness rating needs to be changed. So all of that can be done automatically in the system so that you have a reprocess that is based on technology so that people don't have to remember to do it. It just becomes part of the overall way of doing business. And then all of this information is now available to be able to be reported on. So if we go to the reporting area and I can go down and I can look at, for example, the risk governance, risk and compliance folder and here look at a series of reports that I may be interested in. So for example, it could be that I'm interested in uh, a report that is based upon a specific uh, compliance uh, ISO manure. Now I can see, for example, a summary of all of that information and see if there are any processes and risks that have been associated with that. Or if I'm interested in getting a little bit more detail on that, maybe I do this report, which is a KYC compliance report. And in this report, I'm looking at this through the lens of a regulation. I want to see all the processes that are related to it. I want to know who are accountable for those processes, what risks have been identified, and then based on impact and likelihood, what my inherent risk is. And then I can also see what my residual uh, risk is based upon the controls that have been assigned to it and the effectiveness rating. So in an audit, this can be downloaded for those who don't have access to Process 360 Live, and that information can then be shared with that. Another type of report, which is very important that we also mentioned is the heat map. And the heat map is going to allow you to configure based upon impact and likelihood, the processes and plot them on this heat map. So you can see the riskiest controls, the riskiest processes here. So in this case, it would be this review and qualify personal law, which has a data leak uh, risk, which is considered high. Going into that, I can now see if there are any uh, mitigating controls that have been assigned there. And we can see that, you know, this particular one does not, which would be something that we would need to address. And so you can see here that this single source of truth, which has this risk and compliance capability 
is also going to be of use to that second line of defense, those risky compliance teams, so that they can store their risk management frameworks, see them in the context of those diagrams for the business teams. They can report on that and they can run their assessments from here as well. And then finally, we talked about the third line of defense, which is internal audit and what they're going to need in order to be successful in the role that they play in, in the management of risk and compliance. And we talked about how they also would need that single source of truth and those collaboration tools, which we talked about at length at this point. But there's also another really effective tool that they can use so that they can be effective, and that is process mining. We talked about conformance checking. So let's go ahead and go to a process here. And this time we're going to go to a different process. We're going to go through, excuse me, we're going to go through here. We'll go to this loans process. We'll expand here, go to personal loan. And then we're going to go to review and qualify personal loan. We can see here that we can see a lot of information around the summary and purpose, but we can see information on what your customer is. We can see responsibility, accountability for this process, system use, that the requirement that is involved here is know your customer. And we can see that, again, that data leak and that incomplete P and P screening risk. So again, when someone is interested in understanding whether or not, based upon all of this information, if these systems involved are actually being used, uh, if the roles involved are actually involved in this, if they want to make sure that the process is actually following these steps, then process mining is a great ally in helping them to be able to determine that. And they can go into a process mining project where you're looking at the log files of this information. You're also going to be able to use the uh, model that has been uh, designed in our design module so that you can then look at this specific process and then look at this from a performance checking perspective. I might go in and say that I want to look at this so that I could see uh, how conformant this is to the process that I have. That, I've, that, I, that I'm auditing. And here we can see that the green and uh, establishing the steps, the red establishing the pass between those steps. And we can see here that we have something that's non-conformant. Or I can look at this through the lens of non-conformancy and I can look to see what's non-conformant. So we can see non-conformant paths. We can see uh, non-conformant workarounds. And even if there were things in the model that are not in the data set, well, I can, again, go here, show my model and see if there are any pathways or any specific steps that are in the model that are in the data set. Now I can clearly see that this specific process has a couple of problems and that there are things in design that are stated should be happening that are not happening. And we can also see things that are happening that shouldn't be happening. And so if this were a process that needs to be followed in this exact way, then this would alert uh, and provide proof that this would be something that needs to be addressed. Now, in the event of uh, some changes were proposed and the auditor the next time around wanted to know if those changes actually were made to the actual new design of the process, they would be able to compare this specific process with er earlier versions of the process so that they can see uh, a side-by-side -side comparison so that they can make sure that the individual process changes uh, actually have been met. And this will allow them to be able to get further proof that their recommendations were actually implemented. And then finally, we talked about predictive analytics. Suppose there is a, a regulation that states that, as mentioned before, that specific users or specific customers need to be responded to in a specific amount of time, and you want to make sure that they are, rather than wait until you're non-compliant, you would be able to use predictive analytics to be able to let you know whether or not that's happening and provide an alert for something that's likely to not be compliant. So in this example, we're just going to look at processes that are in progress for processes that, for things that we are, um, that are in progress. And now if I go here to any of these, I can now click on prediction and I can now uh, run a prediction algorithm and see, for example, when this specific case is scheduled to finish based upon the information that has been trained on. And that way you can see whether or not 
this is going to take longer than you would like it to take. But again, you don't have to wait until that occurs. You can actually have an alert be sent out based upon what process mining is predicting is going to happen. And by doing that, you can get ahead of problems and make sure that you're not being reactive, but proactive in uh, solving problems.